Today we're looking at the best AEW match of 2023, a dream match between technical wrestling sensations Brian Danielson and Zack Sabre Jr. from AEW Wrestle Dream October 1st, 2023 at the Climate Pledge Arena in Seattle. With Kiyoshi Tamura no longer having a home to display his otherworldly technical wizardry after running his final U-Style show on November 23rd, 2005, for all intents and purposes ending the shoot wrestling era in Japan, despite Yuki Ishikawa and Daisuke Ikeda's enjoyable attempts at small-scale revivals. The best technical wrestler conversation centered on Brian Danielson in the second half of that decade. As he gained more experience and notoriety, Zack Sabre Jr. took over the mantle in the second part of the 2010s. Though they met twice before, neither encounter was what one would describe as a proper, satisfying match between two all-time greats, as both were one-sided wins for Danielson very early in Sabre's career. Their initial encounter took place on March 2, 2008 at the Jolly Baker Club in Coventry, England. It was the first notable, and perhaps also the first good match of Zack Sabre Jr.'s career. At this point, Danielson was in his heel stage, trying to get heat by annoying the crowd, while Sabre was less of an out-and-out -out Mac technician, in the sense that he used a bit more athletic junior-style offense, such as the tope. The overconfident best-in-the-world Danielson smartly led his 21-year-old opponent through a match that actually did a lot to increase Sabre's stock, even though Danielson largely dominated, as Danielson knew when and how to give the talented and over-kid offense to keep the very partisan British crowd of about 30 involved and make Sabre look strong in defeat. Sabre displayed impressive submission offense, moving and countering well, but was reasonably less confident in other areas. It was difficult to determine whether referee Damien Dunn blew the finish, or they planned on turning a one-fall match into the most unconventional two-out-of-three-fall match. But after Danielson was announced as the winner, the promoter tried to claim it was only a two-count, despite Sabre clearly not having even come close to beating the count. Danielson asked a little girl in the stand who was wearing his t-shirt if she wanted him to agree to five more minutes, and she responded, I want an hour! After the restart, Danielson continued to dominate, but Zack was able to small package Danielson when Brian was going for the pin after hitting his superplex. Now Danielson's fans made false claims of a two count, and a deciding fall was added. Here, Zack tried for the flash pin again after Danielson hit an avalanche style backdrop, but this time Danielson was ready and reversed for the win. Though Zack was miles from the fighter he would become, he was a solid opponent who knew how to move and counter, making it a fun match that's still worth watching. Their March 9, 2009 rematch, a quarterfinal in the WXW 16 karat gold tournament, was unfortunately quite forgettable. The fans in Oberhausen were at their most obnoxious even before the match started, more into their own silly, irrelevant chance than anything Danielson was or wasn't going to do, and he just took it easy against an inferior opponent. In Danielson's defense, he went all out defeating Bad Bones in a hard-fought, nearly 28-minute match to capture the WXW world title later in that show, and overall worked an hour and 50 minutes that weekend after the lengthy flight to Germany. The Bad Bones match was quite good, a very competitive hard-hitting bout that felt like a big important contest. The Zack match was basically just a jobber match, with an arrogant Danielson stretching and contorting the kid, who was doing very little in return not really even countering or making Danielson work. Danielson angered the ref by flipping him off, so he fast counted when Zack ducked a kick and went into a flash pin. Zack advanced to the semi-final, where he lost to another future legend, Shingo Takagi, but certainly his 2008 match against Danielson where he lost did a lot more to actually make him look like a winner than this thing. Thankfully, their 2023 match was nothing like their previous two, as they were finally presented as equals, and thus truly allowed to do their thing. They did a lot of feeling out, parody, and mirror spots to show how evenly matched they now were, as well as their respect for what the opponent was capable of. The early portion did a great job of creating anticipation. Unlike almost anything else we see in AEW, they were able to build a match without killing their bodies by putting the focus on the little details and what the wrestlers are capable of doing rather than big, grand, and probably dangerous actions. All the action took place in the ring, relying on escapes, counters, and creativity, rather than dives, weapons, and blood. Despite removing so much of what AEW does, it felt far more varied because they weren't just moving from one of the usual tropes to another. 
There was way more depth to the technical wrestling than what we would see from even their matches against lesser opponents. Both would make a little progress, come close to a hold or have one locked momentarily, but ultimately, the opponent would react properly to their movement, shift their weight, roll through, somehow alleviate the pressure or counter into their own attack, resulting in a stalemate that was never dull because they kept trying new things even if they weren't exactly working. It all evolved in a manner that felt natural and logical. Hold after hold, counter after counter, they progressed through so many great little moments of frustration and one-upsmanship, building the match with great attention to detail and making even the smallest movements feel substantial. They created heat and garnered anticipation through their pride and determination to outclass each other, as well as their resourcefulness. Their very different styles of technical wrestling, Sabre on the smooth and slick side and Danielson on the gritty and grindy side, balanced each other out to create something that wasn't too effortless or too deliberate. In the old world of sport tradition, they started out honorably, slowly escalating into a fight, with the first strike coming when Zack broke cleanly seven minutes in, but then decided to land a European uppercut while Danielson was still in the ropes. This baited Dragon into a European uppercut exchange, which Danielson began by throwing with his left arm to protect the recently broken right arm, but Zack's taunt suckered him into throwing with a steel rod inserted right arm instead. Danielson was immediately shaking his arm out in between uppercuts, and since he knew it was coming, after a couple, Zack was able to re-injure the arm by stepping forward and blocking it with his own arm. This led to the first segment of control, where Zack was working over the injured arm. Sabre is a bad opponent to face when you aren't 100%, as he has all the knowledge required to exploit your weaknesses with his painful joint manipulations, and will gleefully do so. Danielson shifted to working on the knee, with a couple painful looking dragon screws, but Zack wasn't compromised coming in, so it was hard for Danielson to play even when they were countering back and forth into locks targeting these appendages. There was a nice bit where Danielson tried to come back with a half crab, but couldn't use his right arm to complete the lock. They did a great job at telling simple little stories, crafting a series of small battles that flowed together and fit into a greater whole. The match contained some of the best selling of the year, particularly from Danielson, because rather than stopping the action endlessly, it was mostly done through facial expressions and body movements while they continued to try to push through the pain to make the best move they could at the moment to help them win the match. While the first half was all about the crisp, fluid technical wrestling the match promised to deliver, successfully depicting the struggle between two wily masters, as the animosity increased and the desire to win took hold, the second half was more of a violent striking battle. The goal was ultimately to win the match rather than to win via submission, and one of the reasons it became increasingly striking oriented in the latter stages is they were both such great grapplers they negated each other by always having the counter to every stretch or submission. Danielson is theoretically the better striker, but he was having difficulty using his primary striking arm, and Zack began targeting his strikes, such as the European uppercut and the penalty kick, to the bad arm to add to these woes. The intensity continually escalated, whether through harder strikes or more sadistic contortions. The counters back and forth were exceptional, just very fast, fluid, and flowing as they moved into new submissions or pinning predicaments. One of the things that makes them great is unlike most wrestlers who simply have the same stuff to do in every match, they are able to switch up their offense based on the damage done to their opponent as well as what their opponent has done to them. They can take many different routes to get to their destination. Sabre should have won in the sense that he's the younger, healthier, and more informed fighter, and also has yet to beat Danielson, but Danielson had to win because he's the hometown hero, and this shift to striking was also the story that made it reasonable for Danielson to actually win. Zack had the answer to every hold Danielson threw at him, but he was better off early on during the honorable exchanges than after he became frustrated he wasn't gaining the traction he normally does. Striking worked for Sabre initially, but it's overall a much stronger part of Danielson's arsenal, and the more Danielson threw, the more Zack could only fire back to answer him, rather than seize control through a counter. While the exchanges were fairly equal, Danielson has finishers in that realm, while Zack really doesn't, and ultimately Danielson was able to take this with two Busaiko knees. The finish was more of a reasonable conclusion than one that put this over the top as a great match. Danielson had to resort to hard hitting when it was clear he couldn't win solely via technical wrestling. So in the end, 
Sabre can still claim to be the best technical wrestler in the world, while Danielson remains the all-around better, tougher, and more determined pro wrestler, which perhaps for the last time was still just enough here. I have very high hopes for the rematch in New Japan on February 11, 2024, but regardless of what happens there, we finally have a match here that will be looked back upon for years as one that actually lived up to their great potential. I give this match 4.5 out of 5 stars.